Hello. Welcome to the Billy Wilder Theater. I'm Claudia Bester. I'm the director of public programs here at the Hammer Museum. And I'm very pleased to welcome you to tonight's reading by our favorite novelist, Mona Simpson. Right on. Um, she's going to be in discussion tonight with our very special guest, David O. Russell. Yeah. Mona Simpson has curated a literary series here at the Hammer Museum called Some Favorite Writers for the past nine years, featuring some of the greatest living, living literary talents. Um, but in all those years, she has never read from her own work here. So when she was finishing up her latest novel called Casebook, I asked her to please, please, please come and do a reading here when the novel came out. And she finally said yes, so I'm very thrilled that she's here tonight reading her own work. So now I'd like to introduce the five-time Academy Award no nominated writer and director, David O. Russell. Yeah. As you all know, David O. Russell co-wrote and directed American Hustle, which earned no less than 10 Academy Award nominations this year, including Best Picture, Best Director, Best Original Screenplay, and Acting nominations in all four categories. The film also won three Golden Globe Awards, including Best Picture, three BAFTAs, including Best Original Screenplay, and won the Best Picture, Best Screenplay, and Best Supporting Actress Awards from the New York Film Critics Circle. Russell's previous film, Silver Linings Playbook, was also a huge box office success and a major Oscar contender with eight Academy Award nominations and a win for Best Lead Actress for Jennifer Lawrence. In addition, his 2010 film, The Fighter, earned seven Oscar nominations. So by my account, that adds up to 25 Oscar nominations in the past four years, which is pretty extraordinary. Um, his earlier films, all of which I absolutely love, include I Heart Huckabees, which I heart, um, Three Kings, Flirting with Disaster, and Spanking the Monkey. In addition to being a great director, Russell's also an advocate for many causes. He's a longtime board member of the Ghetto Film School, an organization based in the South Bronx that supports young black and Latino filmmakers. He also works on behalf of youth with learning disabilities and mental health problems, and has lobbied Congress for improving and expanding mental health services and treatment around the nation. So please join me in welcoming David O. Russell. Hi, thank you guys, thanks for coming out. Uh, sometimes uh, fortuitous things happen in life where you meet very special people, and uh, there was a day in uh, 1994 where I was standing on the corner of 99th and West End where I lived with my one-year-old in my arms because I had cabin fever, and uh, I was going to do a crime if I didn't go outside. And uh, so uh, came walking towards me with a, with a, uh, a, a, a stroller was a woman in an impeccable white kind of uh, linen-y outfit and uh, her very handsome uh, uh, former attorney, writer, husband and their son. And it was uh, Mona and, uh, and Richard Appel, to whom she was married for long enough for it to count in California law. Um, uh, and uh, <clears throat> we all moved to California around the same time, uh, he, Richard for The Simpsons, which he wrote for, and I to make a film called Three Kings, which actually had its premiere in this. It was the first time I ever set foot in this place. I didn't know where I was or what, it, what I was doing here, but it was this place. Um, and uh, I just moved here from New York. They moved here, we moved here. Uh, they got divorced, we got divorced. Um, <clears throat> So um, life goes on, and um, you know, but they're they're two of the most special people I've ever met, and I feel I was very lucky to be standing on that corner that day because uh, they're both wonderful people, uh, uh, two of the best ones I ever met. And Mona is a who we're here to talk about tonight in this wonderful um, privilege to have her. You know, she's a, she's one of the most formidable minds and people I've ever met in every area. Um, she's uh, an intense person, and in spite of her intensity. Uh, she once put on a gorilla suit uh, at my at my son's birthday. So that's you know, so that playfulness is what allows you to have a, something as wonderful as this novel. I'm going to brag on her a little bit because she's some serious business. Her statistics, according to Major League Baseball, are pretty major. Um, you know, she's up in the front ranks of our best novelists. She's been called that by many a critic. She batted 350 four seasons in a row and won the Triple Crown. Um, She's been compared to Willa Cather, Sherwood Anderson, and Chekhov for her meticulousness. Um, that ain't a joke. Um, uh, she's been editor of the Paris Review, a professor at both UCLA and Bard College, and of course, 
best-selling author of several acclaimed novels. Her work has been awarded a Guggenheim grant, an NEA grant, a Hoder Fellowship from Princeton University. Not bad for the granddaughter of a mink farmer from Green Bay, Wisconsin. Uh, her first novel, The Mother-Daughter Tale Anywhere But Here, instantly established her as a force to be reckoned with. In its review, many, many major critics said she just had emerged as a master. Um, I was reading, it was kind of fun to do this homework assignment for my old friend. Um, you know, just as she just came out fully formed, um, uh, like someone in a Star Wars movie, just I'm a full master. Uh, every sight, sound, taste, and touch, her narrative experience is described with uncanny precision. As a portrait of daughter enthralled to a nearly lethal mother anywhere but here is brilliant, funny, at times astonishing. I completely agree. Um, it was made into a movie that was not as astonishing, but that's the, the writer always wins that SmackDown, um, as uh, she, I think, was confident at the time. Uh, it starred Susan Sarandon and Natalie Portman. Um, so that prize, I mean, I, we could go on and on. She's won many accolades. The Whiting Prize, a literature award from the American Academy of Arts and Letters, and was a finalist for the Penn Faulkner Award. She followed it with The Lost Father, another remarkable book. Um, you know, which I could read many accolades about, um, all the way through A Regular Guy, uh, Off Keck Road, an amazing novella, you know, that received amazing praise. Um, and uh, A Regular Guy in particular was compared by more than one critic. Uh, the main character was compared to Gatsby and Mona to Fitzgerald. She spent 10 years writing a book called My Hollywood, um, which is really brilliant, you know. Yeah, there you go. Now, come on! And... Um, and uh, it was kind of amazing to, you know, have n known her during that period somewhat and uh, her, her, her family. And it was a brilliant thing to write about the double life of the Filipino who now was a servant in this country who had, in the Philippines, had servants. And uh, just about the mother and that person. And it's a brilliant, brilliant meditation on all American myths uh, and reinventing them, really. Um, fortunately, she did not take another 10 years to write this book, um, Case Book. Um, she turned this one around pretty quick. Um, and this is narrated by the 15-year-old Miles Adler Hart, who hires a private investigator, an idea I always love, um, uh, to in investigate his parents' divorce. And it's just a fantastic idea that even ha he makes that, and he makes, you know, a book with his friend Hector about it, and they do drawings, you know, and it's just kind of a brilliant insight into the heartbreak of life and, and, and growing up and what's really happening. And they, they discover more than fun when they're hiding under the bed. He's hiding under the bed. He finds out some very serious stuff that he never bargained for. Um, I could keep going on about her. Um, I have all sorts of fun stuff that I researched, but I, I think I'm just going to, uh, to, to introduce her now, um, the, the, the lovely and brilliant uh, Mona Simpson. I think that's not only the best introduction I've ever gotten, but that I ever will get. So <laughs> maybe we should just stop there. We can do better. We'll do better next time. Um, so, gosh, so much to talk about. Um, I have a million questions for you. Um, uh, can you can you begin um, by telling us? Uh, I read somewhere that this book uh, either came to you or was worked on in the Santa Monica Library. Is that true? That's really true. I, um, for various personal reasons, I was, I was, I have, I've often had an office, a little office in Santa Monica where I work. I teach as well, and I have a, a lovely office at UCLA. But um, I've always worked close to home. But for this novel, for various reasons, I really wanted to be in public. I just, I didn't want to be alone. I was having, there was illness in my family and, and various things, and I, I just wanted to be in a public place. It was, it was magical to work in the library. There's a whole community, actually, in the public library. The homeless people, the people researching their family um, origins. There's a, there's a de facto community. I love libraries, you know. They um, have almost become strangely obsolete in the age of the internet, but that just makes me love them five times more because um, I'm an old-fashioned person. And I, I, I love the analog nature of it. So I, yeah. I, which, which was it, the, which branch was it? It was actually the new Santa Monica Library, which is almost perfectly set up for writers. There's, mm. there's the desk with the lamp just where you want it and the plug just where you want it. And now you're allowed to bring in beverages. 
<laughs> you know, that was always the big problem with libraries, but they've acceded to our needs in desperation. Um, did the idea come to you suddenly, or was it one you had in your back pocket for a while? I, I wanted to write this love story, um, but I, I couldn't really, for whatever reasons, uh, maybe my own failings, no doubt my own failings, I couldn't write it full on. I needed, I wanted to set the lovers. There's, there's enough of me that's always thinking, well, sure, they think that. You know, there was a part of me that wanted to set the, the story of the lovers within a family for whom who you know, were not necessarily rooting only for the, the lover's happiness. It, the kids are thinking, how will this affect me? You know, what do I want from this? What will I get from this? Will this hurt me? Will this help me? Um, viewed from the outside, as it were. Right, viewed yeah. from the outside of the lovers. Yes. Yeah. To be under their bed, literally. Quite. Know, listening, listening to their conversations. Right. Um, so There's a, a kid who, who sort of... Um, Spot, who spies on his parents, um, really expecting to find out fairly normal things, what he'll be allowed to do, what he won't be allowed to do, whether he can watch Survivor or whether he can't. And, you know, even if you get the wrong answer to something like that, it's finally reassuring because it's, it's what's supposed to happen. You, you know, but to his surprise, his parents aren't always talking about him. It happens. <laughs> tell me one other thing. While I'm pulling out all my questions, I want you to tell me one other thing that motivated you to put it in the... V did you know you wanted it to be in the eyes of the, of the boy? Of, of, and what was it like to write from a male uh, narrator that was a 15-year-old boy? Um... I, I when I start when I got that vantage when I sort of hit on the the point of view of the fifteen year old boy the young boy that's when it started to move for me so yeah that's when in a way that's when it started there's something so uh, it's one of my favorite of your books you know and I and you've written so many magnificent books that are they they go deep you know uh, uh, I, there's something about whether it's Huckleberry Finn or or or, or Holden Caulfield about that teenage narrator that I, I mean I don't know if you dislike it or maybe I've stepped in doo-doo no, right now <laughs> maybe, maybe I stepped in uh, literary doo-doo right now I don't know <laughs> but, I, but I, that's just my opinion I just I happen to I'm a sucker for that I love that I love listening to a kid and there's drawings by him in the book yes you know? that's right and the it, artist I think is here tonight Alexander the Laird there he is. right there could you stand up please sir no you will not stand up will you're gonna have to deal up. with your fame eventually <laughs> Unless you want to live like J.D. Salinger. Well, there's a young man in a hoodie with a, with a curly set of hair right here. And he did the illustrations, which I think are just fantastic. You know, it's like these kids are making, it's such a brilliant idea. Yeah, bravo to you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, to have this, like these kids making their book about what they're spying on, it's just such a delicious idea. I mean, I think it's, very movie like if you don't mind my saying so and i love that and i love that they talk about it's it, you know it's it's juicy and they, and they talk about so many movies in the in the book that i happen i don't think any of your books had mentioned this many movies because he's always asking and one of the ones he asked for is rear window where's rear right. window which is, which is another of course about spying please say go on, i'm talking to well you. Rear, rear window is all about spying and, and voyeurism yeah and and getting caught up and then becoming moving from being the voyeur to being the actor because you, you, you see something you weren't supposed to see. And then yeah. deciding what to do with that knowledge. And the boy hires an actual detective. Yes. Uh, yes, a grown-up. Um, and, and the mother is having uh, her first affair or relationship outside the marriage. Uh, can you tell us a little After bit After the about? marriage. Okay. You know, I don't think that's so important. I'm just kidding. Okay, so... Okay, so... <laughs> so... <laughs> So anyway, <coughs> so, no, 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 but tell, tell me, but tell me, tell me, tell, tell, say a little bit about that, that other relationship. This obviously, about I know, I hate when people go, is this autobiographical? <laughs> you know, I mean, it's like, you know, I'm not going to ask that question. But so, so just, just tell us a little bit about the, the love relationship and that, that character brilliantly is called 
a con artist of love, correct? Because he's a liar. He's a brilliant liar. His name liar. is Eli. Yes, he's, but he's a liar to both yeah. families, which is they cancel each other out. And Eli, yeah, it's, that's what I thought. That was kind of a brilliant thing you said. And and I like the way the names of the the two main characters are Miles the two, and Eli. Miles and Eli. They, Eli, the words fit inside the letters of Miles. That's the sort of thing writers spend their <laughs> <laughs> afternoons thinking about. Please, I'm going to ask you to talk more about that right now. <laughs> about what, the letters? That or the thing, that whole thing, the, 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 the parallelism between those two guys, what you were thinking or feeling. Well, when you I mean, these kids are spying on their parents, not only on the mother, but mainly on the mother, but also the, the dad's romantic lives. And they're, they're watching things and they're, they're finding out stuff they, they really don't want to know. But that's all happening at the age where they're beginning to just barely have their own ideas about trust and, and love and risk and suspicion and, and all that. So they, they're, they're figuring out what they can do in, in, in their lives and what they're going to want to do. Yeah, and they and they see the, you know, the, the first girl with her, her shirt off, and, and uh, that know. happens. Yes, and uh, but it's just it's just magnificent that their innocence is you know is right cheek by jowl with this reality that happens to most marriages, or at least more than ha half, at least half. I mean, a lot of them. Uh, you know, that's just a heartbreak right there. Even to say that sentence to me, you know, yeah. and that's one of the hardest things about. Having a divorce is your children's perception of what they thought the world was. Right. Um, it's certainly the hardest thing, I think. I mean, it's funny with the the novel. We're always we're always thinking about you know families and how we live now. And the the first great novel that I can think of that had a a significant divorce and and also children and it was was what Maisie knew by Henry James and and at that time the divorce rate in America was something like seven percent so it's become much more a part of how we live now and our children have to have to contend with that now I wonder you know um, the the husband while he's not perfect portrayed in the book is is is, is a good person yeah, um, I think he's yeah, yes. a likable yes. person. Yes, and I, I wondered, you know, if you uh, and, he, and he absolutely loves his son. You know, he's right. a good father. And his, a, his twin daughters. Yes, he loves his. He's a good guy. Yeah, and and so I wondered if you had, you know, because I've experienced this in my own work. Was when I was younger, I would be much more likely to eviscerate a grown up than I would now. <laughs> uh, um, you know, I remember, like, I mean, the graduate for me was like, you know, my, the, you know, the grown ups. <laughs> man, I'm alienated, man. And, and now I said, there's something that happened, like, in the last 10 years where I was like, is it really that bad? You, what, what happened? You went to college, you came home. I don't, you said they want you to have a job. Wait, explain it to me. You had, you, you had to have sex with your hot friend, parent's friend. I don't, and then the daughter. I don't, you know, so. <laughs> my my, pers my own perspective has changed, and I wondered if there was any if uh, any compassion in your own heart towards a more more uh, more uh, I don't know what the word is uh, sympathetic towards uh, grown ups or what I certainly want to portray them. I, and I'm not saying you wouldn't write another book now and eviscerate somebody. I'm sure you could and would, but I, I don't. But <laughs> nobody I nobody here. I, that, that, no, no, no. Those are the no. Those are the weapons of our trade, right? You know, that's, but I but I mean, you know, sometimes <laughs> you just got to do what you got to do. But, <laughs> Because that's the character and what it wants or the story. But I wondered if there was some movement in any way, a kind of compassion. Well, I think there's, you know, I think, first of all, you want to avoid the expected thing. You know, that's why uh, in my, my last novel, My Hollywood, I, I wrote about a nanny and, a, and her employers. And neither were perfect, God knows, but, but, but the employers weren't awful, abusive people either. You know, it, they weren't exploiting her in obvious. They they weren't. They were trying to be conscious and to do the right thing. And I think it's 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 interesting to write about about the nuanced um, problems people have when they're not when they're not extreme and they're not explosive and they're not violently etched. I think the gray area is more interesting. Yeah. Yeah. 
And sometimes more true. Yes. People are not all bad or all good. Right. Most people. That's yeah. part of what these kids have to discover because they're, they're so, their art is all about good and evil. And yet they realize halfway through that they don't really even believe that they don't really even believe in evil yet. They haven't seen anyone really do something mean, some something very mean to anyone else. So they've been involved in this kind of aesthetic morality play or, or just play all their lives, but then they're really confronted with something that could hurt them and hurt their families. And still, the idea of evil in the Star Wars sense is maybe eluding them. Right. Yeah. That's so interesting and so real. Um, and that's Chekhovian from where I grew up, you know. Mm. And I want to ask you about where you grew up. If you just do you mind talking for one minute about where you grew up? Sure. I grew up in um, Green Bay, Wisconsin, which is a kind of a paper mill town. It's the home of the Green Bay Packers, publicly owned football team, which elicits enormous pride because it's it's kind of the it's the it's the pride of the the city because it. It doesn't have that much else. It's got a, a polluted river. It's got piles of sulfur along the banks of the river. There's um, lots of meat packing. I went I went home last year for a funeral and learned that the predominantly white town was now integrated, but sort of for sad reasons because all kinds of immigrants came to take the jobs, these terrible jobs in the slaughterhouses and the meat packing companies yes and so and so you still go back there from time to time i do yeah and you wrote off keck road was set there yeah um uh about someone who that was very sure word anderson to me i mean again i could be saying all the wrong things i was telling <laughs> you what, i'm just saying tell you what i think you know that that was like this very closely observed experience of someone living in that world their entire life in that world with yeah. the disappointments of it um, well I left when I was a child and whenever you have whenever there's a break in your life I'm sure everyone's experienced that you, you have a kind of double life and you're also kind of you're living as if you'd stayed you, you wonder about how mm -hmm. you'd be different mm -hmm. how your life would be different it's a fantastic question if, what if you stayed yeah, yeah. What, if you what if you stayed? And it can be a fantasy for yeah. some time. And then, and then so interesting to explore the reality of it, the uh, anywhere but here uh, reality of it. Uh, right. That it always seems better somewhere else. Um, and when you broke through with your first book, did you, uh, where were you working? You were working at a, a literary magazine at that Yeah, time. I was working at the Paris Review. I was an editor. Um, I, I made $9,000 a year in my... My socks were wearing out, so it was a good thing I finally did sell a novel. Um, but actually, it was very sad, because I'd been at the Paris Review five years, and it was sort of time to go, so I left. But that had been a, a kind of a wonderful life. I'd, I'd, I'd worked, you know, I basically sat in a chair by the window in a, in a coat closet of George Plimpton's apartment, and I'd read these manuscripts that people sent over the transom, you know, and I still run into people who say, oh, I corresponded with you for years at the Paris Review. You never took my story, but, you know, we corresponded for years and years. So, so, so you would write these letters to people? Only to people whose stories I liked. I mean, you had, you had your champions, and sometimes you couldn't get others to agree with you. You wouldn't say that. Would you say that in the letter? No. Oh, okay, but but you would just be generous with them. You would be you would, yeah. You would I would I would write time. about the story and give them some praise about what yeah, and also about. ask questions and you know yeah. So in a way, like you were already having that dialogue, like you would as a teacher. Yeah. And then, and then uh, when, when so when you stopped doing that, you just were writing your novel. All the yeah, time? I was writing the next novel. Um, I went to Princeton for a year, um, and started the Lost Father. I was so kind of green. I, I got this fellowship at Princeton. I thought I was sort of meant to be there, but I didn't have an apartment there. But they gave me this nice office, so I, I, I thought, well, I'll go there a couple times a week. I lived in New York. I thought, I can sleep in the office. So I, I sort of brought sheets and a blanket and, and slept in the office my first night. In the middle of the night, I think I scared the night guard, who I guess <laughs> normally comes in to clean the floors to death because he turned the lights on and there was this... Did you sleep there a girl. lot or was that... No, that was, that was the last the time. <laughs> Didn't work out. 
I love, I did not know that about you. <laughs> that you did that. Um, now, what about I'm sorry, your process? Do you have a, I know you're a, a very precise person, to say the least. So is your process, uh, uh, do, you, do, you, do you ever listen to music when you write? You said you, this was the first book you'd written by kind of hanging out in public, because you wanted to be in public. Right. What's your, do you have a usual ritual? Um, I love music, but I can't listen to music while I write. Um, so no, I, I have to really just be working. I mean, I just have to be, I usually read, all I do is I read and I write, and I read and I write. And then I read and I rewrite, and so that's kind of what I do. Do you outline before? Do you, do you um, sometimes I do, but the outlines are fairly, fairly malleable. Um, for me, it's a matter of sort of getting deep enough in the work so that I'm really seeing the work, the world as a kind of grid. I find if I, when I'm starting something, if I work a certain number of hours, if I'm sort, there's a sort of a, like a watermark. If I, if I work three hours or more, then all the time during the day when I'm running, when I'm doing errands, whatever, I'm still in the novel and I'm plucking things out from the world that sort of fit in that grid. I'm sort of imposing that structure. Um, whereas if I work a little less than that, then all the time that I'm not working, I'm not working and I'm not thinking of it. So for me, it's sort of a question of getting deep enough in. Critical mass. Yeah, so that I'm sort of always in it. Three hours is about can maybe do Depends it. on the stage of the book. You know, in the late stages where you're just holding all the language at once in your head, really the more the better. You can work eight hours, nine hours. Because you want to remember what verbs you used two chapters ago, you know. Mm, very precise, yeah. <laughs> no, no, I love it. I'm not joking. Sorry. And, I don't know um, if it's precise. It's sort of, yes, it's, no, but it's, I love, it's no, systemic. But it's, There's yes, a systemic yes, quality yes, It's about novels. the language, the love of language. And, and, and the yeah, cohesion. Yeah, There's a structural yes, puzzle that yes, you're trying yes. to... Yes. And do you ever write scenes out of order? Yeah. Right? Sometimes yeah. there's a great scene, and you're like, I'm not sure when this is going to come, yeah. but I feel inspired to write this scene. Yeah, all yeah. the time. That's a good way to do it. Do yeah. you do that too? Yes. Because yeah. it's just, it's like, well, at least, you know, that came out. You know, there's a lot of other stuff I haven't figured out or that you struggle right. with. Um, how, do you mind talking a little bit about um, some of the harder times or the struggle part? Oh, sure. There's lots of struggle part in novels, they're long. They're every day. And, you know, when you think of it, 365 days a year, novels are around 300 pages. If you could just write a day, a page a day successfully, you've had a novel every year. But it generally doesn't work that way. So that gives you just the, the most basic sense of the struggle. No, that it's, it's very hard. You, you know, especially right now, the world is not especially dying for another novel. You know, so there's there's really no reason to do it unless unless you can make it as good as you can possibly as it can, as you can possibly make it. You know, and if if you can't give it all your you have, there's no really no reason to do it at this point. Um, so so those are the struggles. Mm. Do you ever have a uh, a, a, a sort of a, a a plot or a character struggle? Like you have an idea that you love. But the idea that you love to make it come real when you get down on the ground in it turns out to be, of course, uh, trickier than or, or, or yes. frustrating. frustrating. All the time. Right? All the time. No, no, it's never. It's. I mean, the the best moment of a book is before you really start writing mm. it. It's that sort of beautiful <laughs> symphonic hole you 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 feel in your head, and you can never quite get that. Um, but you can yeah. try. That is fantastic to hear you say that. It's very comforting and, and also <laughs> uh, troubling, um, I, I, so, which is true. I, so I, I um, you know, um, I, I, uh, I think we should hear you read a little something if you're okay with that. Yeah, I'll read it a little yeah, tiny. That okay? Wouldn't that be nice to hear her read a little something? Yeah. I'll read the very opening, just a little bit. This is a boy talking. I was a snoop, but a peculiar kind. I only discovered what I most didn't want to know. The first time it happened, I was nine. 
I'd snaked underneath my parents' bed when the room was empty to rig up a walkie-talkie. Then they strolled in and flopped down, so I was stuck under their bed until they got up. I'd wanted to eavesdrop on her, not them. She decided my life. Just then, the moms were debating weeknight television. I needed, I believed I absolutely needed to understand Survivor. You had to, to talk to people at school. The moms yakked about it for hours in serious voices. The only thing I liked that my mom approved of that year was chess. And every other kid, every single other kid in fourth grade owned a Game Boy. I thought maybe Charlie's mom could talk sense into her. She listened to Charlie's mom. On top of the bed, my dad was saying that he didn't think of her that way anymore either. What way? And why either? I could hardly breathe. The box spring made a gauzy opening to gray dust towers and globular, fantastic formations. The sound of dribbling somewhere came in through open windows. My dad stood and locked the door from inside, shoving a chair up under the knob. Before, when he did that, I'd always been on the other side, where I belonged. And it hurt not to move. Down, my mother said. Left, which meant he was rubbing her back. All my life, I'd been aware of him wanting something from her, and of her going sideways in his spotlight, a deer at the sight of a human. The three of us, the originals, were together, locked in a room. My mom was nice enough looking for a smart woman. Pretty for a mathematician, I'd heard her once say about herself with an air of apology. Small, with glasses, she was the kind of person you didn't notice. I'd seen pictures, though, of her holding me as a baby. Then her hair fell over her cheek, and she'd been pretty. My dad was always handsome. Simon's mom, a jealous type, said that my mother had the best husband, the best job, the best everything. I thought she had the best everything, too. We did. But Simon's mom never said my mother had the best son. The bed went quiet, and it seemed then that both my parents were falling asleep. My dad napped weekends. No, I begged telepathically, my left leg pinned and needled. Plus, I really had a pee. But my mother, never one to let something go when she could pick it apart, asked if he was attracted to other people. He said he hadn't ever been, but lately, for the first time, he felt aware of opportunities. He used that word. Like who? I bit the inside of my cheek. I knew my dad. He was about to blab, and I couldn't stop him. And sure enough, idiotically, he named a name. By second grade, everyone I knew had understood never to name a name. <laughs> Holland Emerson, he said. What kind of name was that? Was she Dutch? <laughs> oh, the mim said. You've always kind of liked her. I guess so, he said, as if he hadn't thought of it until she told him. <laughs> then the mattress dipped like a whale to squash me, and I scooched over to the other side as the undulation rolled. I didn't do anything, Reen. She got up. Then I heard the chair fall and him following her out of the room. I'm not going to do anything. You know me. But he'd started it. He'd said opportunities. He'd named a name. I bellied out, skidded to the bathroom, missing the toilet by a blurt. A framed picture of them taken after he'd proposed hung on the wall, her holding the six-inch diamond ring from the party supply shop. On the silvery photograph, he'd written, I promise to always make you unhappy. I'd grown up with his jokes. By the time I slept to the kitchen, he sat eating a bowl of Special K. He lifted the box. Want some? Don't fill up. She stood next to the wall phone. We're having the Audrey's for dinner. Tonight, he said, can we cancel? I think I'm coming down with something. We canceled them twice already. The doorbell rang. It was the dork guy who came to run whenever she called him. He worked for the National Science Foundation and liked to run and talk about fractals.
That was really good. I wanted to keep going. Um, it's going to be hard to recover from that. I just wanted to stay in the book. It was so good. Um, was that... The f think of stupid questions to ask. Was that the first thing you wrote in the book? Sorry. She said she doesn't remember. I said I don't remember. I think it was. I think the scene was, although, you know, every... I tend to rewrite... It's such a great opening. Rewrite a lot, but... Yeah, I think that the basic scene was the first, the beginning of the book. It's like the DNA, the whole, all the DNA of the book is in that scene, you know, to me. You know, you could clone the book from that scene. You know? <laughs> I mean, because, because, you know, like all the, you know, it's just like everything that is the heart of it is, it's, I'm hanging on every breath of the, what's happening and what's the two emotional worlds and the, what's happening with the parents on the bed. Um, mm. What made you think you wanted to do drawings? The funness of the idea. Of I try. I them? tried. I really tried. I was drawing every day. I just wanted them to. These kids have a big quest, and then at a certain point, their quest is complete, and they've sort of, they've been on a mission, and they've found the information they were looking for, and then they don't know what to do, so they try a couple things, and one of them is they write a cartoon about their experiences. Fantastic. I mean, uh, yeah, I want to. I, I mean, I you know, I want to see that cartoon more than even more than <laughs> is in here. I want to buy that. I can make. A, I'm going to suggest to the publisher a companion volume. <laughs> I think it's such a great idea, um, uh, and so it's because you know what I love is that, like the boy says in the beginning, everybody at school. It's so true. With their with their Game Boys and their everything they have at school. The survivors. Yeah, yeah he's no. got to know yeah. the TV show to survive. He's got to do all this stuff. But he's not doing that. He's being far more inventive and interesting than that. You know, he's being more analog than that. He's like, right. he's hiding under a bed. He's making, <laughs> he's, he's making a book, you know, based on these adult truths he's learning with his friend. You know, right. that, what a fantastic undertaking. So much more imaginative than playing with an Xbox or something. Um, uh, and and their experience changes. You know, the book is, the book becomes different than what it what, than their experience. By the time it it's ended, it it's sort of about something else, which was fun. Were you surprised in that, or you knew the whole time? No, I'm always surprised. I kind of knew the ending of this book. I sort of had a sense of the ending, but a lot of things between then surprised me. You can if you didn't get surprised, it wouldn't be very much fun. Sort of, there's a period in the end of a book, like the last year you're working on it, when things you didn't intend start to happen. You know, where two strands you set up begin to braid themselves together. I'm sure it's it's just the unconscious of working, you know, with these various elements for long enough. But that's when it really gets exciting. When things start to present themselves in a way. Yeah, the, the, or when the, the patterns emerge that you hadn't intended. Yeah, yeah, that's fantastic. You've entered some other realm of consciousness at that place where it's taken on a life of its own. Um, and speaking of life of its own, uh, there's a young man here who could read some in the voice of the a young man's voice from the book. And we want his name is Carr, like in what most people got here in. But two of them, two R's. Car. Come on, would you come come up here? Come up here, please. Come up here. <laughs> While I rummaged in my mom's drawer, I heard my parents laughing as they came up the steps outside. I dived under their covers and made myself completely still. They walked in and hangers in the closet assembled. My mom kicked off her shoes. He has a crush on you, all right, my dad said. A crush? Crushing was what girls did, I thought. Every day it was on someone different. At the end of the bed, my father flicked on news. Through eyelashes, I could see him rubbing his socked foot. Did you hear him stammering? I, I'm besotted with your wife. He practically couldn't get the words out. My dad laughed. I guess he really liked your paper. I'm surprised anybody noticed, the mem said. My mom had published one paper about animal locomotion. When two copies of the journal came in the mail, my dad had brought home flowers and they'd gone out to dinner. 
The dork guy had been at UCLA making a site visit for an NSF grant to the department, and he'd picked out my mom to be friends with. He said he'd read her paper, but she thought it was because he wanted a running partner while he was in LA. I'm not worried, my dad said. He's a less good looking version of me. It's not an ugly baby they've got, not like some potatoes we've known. What baby did they think looked like a potato? <laughs> Would my dad call his own daughter a spud? His wife asked me to talk to him. She said, I tell him he's smilier than other babies. She thought he'd come around because he's good with the cat and the dog, so I told him, you'll fall in love with him. Everyone falls in love with their own children. And he said, well, with your babies, sure. Miles was the most beautiful baby, my dad said. And Emma, those curls. Boop one, beautiful, a startling idea. I was alive when the boops were born and I had eyes. Two lumps that wailed was more like it. The wife's kind of a dish rag, my dad said. What's with the Heidi braids? <laughs> you know what she said? After that whole thing about how he didn't love the kid, she told me she was planning to get pregnant again right away. I asked if I thought that was such a good idea, given how he'd taken to this one. She said, in that little girl voice, well, if he's unhappy with everything anyway. Still, it can't hurt for you to have a friend at NSF. My dad cared about the Mims' position in the math world, where she felt she was still a beginner and too old to be. She'd made a miscalculation. She'd tried to solve an open problem and not published anything for five years. Now she had to teach more and didn't get paid her summer ninths. I pretended sleep. They had a little scuffle then over whether to let me stay. But she's always in here, my dad said, meaning my sister. So let him this once. My dad sighed. But he didn't move me. And I slept beautifully between them. This is the section of the book where the, the narrator is remembering when he was allowed to sleep in the bed with his parents, which is wonderful. Um, that he right. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's a book. It's, it's, it's funny. Um, in some ways, it's a, a mother's fantasy of a, of a boy's perspective because it's about a boy and his friend who are obsessed with, with their parents. But I think that is a little bit what can, what can happen. I don't know if I see it all the time, but it's, I realized after I finished the book that um, I, I, had been a, I had grown up with a single mother, and I had watched her romances, and I, while she was dating, she was thinking of love and, and happiness, no doubt, and a future and with hopefulness. And I was thinking, you know, where are this guy's finances? Can he help us pay the rent? You know, is he going to break her heart? Is he going to break her? And and I was aware that that if that was the case, there was nothing I could do to stop it. So I, as a child, you know, watching watching a mother fall in love, I I saw love as almost a a danger, a power I couldn't control. And it was long before I could get any good out of it myself. So. Goes right to the heart of what the book is because you know uh, uh, children grow up with the, the belief in their parents' love and it's like a fact of the house if it's relatively stable. And this book is about going into the rough seas of that breaking apart and becoming what you saw in your mother. You know the, right. the danger, the danger, the heartbreak. Right. The, suddenly people are going to get hurt. Um, and this this thing where a bed where he's so happy to sleep. Between right. the two of you, it will be no more. Um, mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, it's a killer. <laughs> um, 
But I hope there's a little humor too. Oh, your book is funny <laughs> as hell. Your book is funny as hell. I think that was obvious. I'm not, that was the sad part, though. That sad, that's how you come by it honestly. You got you to go for the sad part. Um, um, I loved that in your debut, you know, that Mishiku Kakutani, and the, uh, I believe it was she who said that you wrote with a confidence and a swagger. You know, that, uh, and I, 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 uh, I, uh, that just seems to be the way your writing comes to you, um, sort of like a, the way a fighter fights or something. It's just your. It's just oh in no! Your what do you mean? <laughs> oh no! What do you mean? Oh no! No, no! It, 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 it's lots of messing around in the dark. <laughs> I mean, the swagger is probably, you know, the 231st draft. I don't even think it's But what swagger. I'll say is, yeah, I'll, let me correct this impression. There's no, swagger can be confused with cockiness. I c consider it, you know, somebody once said, uh, what you call genius is my ninth choice. You know, I did it, you know, I did it nine <laughs> times. No, no, I did it, I did right, it nine or right, ten right. times. You know, it's, I, I did, I, it's craftsmanship. Or you know, 120. So, yes, 120, yeah. So it's your standards uh, that get conveyed into immersing us. We get fully immersed because you've aimed for that target so repeatedly through those hours in the dark or stumbling. Yeah. You've, you've only picked the moments where you feel you're hitting that immersive feeling. And I that's what, yes, no, but that's what I'm gonna say. I'm gonna say that. <laughs> Whether you disagree or not. <laughs> I, think, I think that's what I think. And I think, um, I mean, why should we take some questions from our gang, from from the gang, from people in the audience, about any of the oeuvre from from this this, this writer here tonight? <laughs> um, so I was wondering, when you write your drafts, do you draft it all out and then go back and work on it again and again, or is it more you draft and then you revise as you go along? Well, I do a little of both, and what I used to do is I used to sort of um, write the whole first draft as a kind of exploration and not have no idea where I was going. And then, then I would sort of have a whole messy, humongous draft. And I would kind of slowly revise it. And then it began to, you know, maybe three drafts later, I'd have what people would start with as a structure, kind of, which turned out to be a very inefficient way of doing it. Because you end up polishing endless scenes that get cut. So now I try, now I actually do think about it a little, uh, quite a bit more and, and plot it out a bit more before I start. Uh, but I've come to that kind of authentically. There's something about plot, I don't know, um, I don't know if it was the, the time I was coming of age as a, as a writer or, or just the, the condition, the, the terribly stunted condition of youth where I didn't really believe in plot. You know, it seemed something tacky, really, you know, to be kind of, going for these climaxes and, and all this stuff. But I, I realized it's just because I, I hadn't lived long enough to see that many plots resolve. Um, and now I love plot, you know? I just see it all as plot. As Garcia Marquez had said at one point, you know, it's, to him it was all just carpentry. Uh, this is a question for kind of both of you because, um, you know, Mona, your writing is so fluid and the way you just described your writing Thing, uh, style and, and what you're saying about plot it doesn't seem to lend itself to film, right? Which is going to have a especially kind of commercial or quasi-commercial feature film structure. And I'm sure you've developed uh, material from, um, you know, uh, uh, not, not unformed literary material, but you've had to, you know, saddle things into uh, into a feature film uh, format. So I'm just wondering, for both of you, were you happy with your f experience with... with uh, your first uh, novel being turned into a movie, and how how do you respond to uh, say a, a, this prose uh, that that is you know first person and so forth, and um, you know very fluid in form? I mean, can you talk a little bit about this 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 meeting here that's kind of happening? Does that make sense? <laughs> the flowers I mean, will answer this question. <laughs> uh, maybe this has been answered somewhere else, and I'm. No, uh, I think he's something about film and books. Um, yeah. Uh, talk about that <laughs> a little bit. 
You know, one thing about about novels uh, that what well, what I kind of like about them there's the it's often said that sort of novel I guess you could say a lot of the novels I like don't turn out to be good movies and some novels that aren't great novels turn out to be great movies there's not necessarily a, a correlative relationship it's definitely a second thing but one one thing I I look to novels for these now in my own life just as a reader is I love having a sort of very deep internal experience I love to really enter another mind I mean, when you think about it you know, you learn so much more about characters, really, than you you would even of people you're very intimate with. Um, and so, I look for that internality, and I'm not I'm not sure that's what what films are made of usually. You know, it's a it's a visual dramatic medium, in a way. Does that seem right? Now you 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 adapted you know Silver Linings Playbook. Yes, um, and I, you know some people. Alexander Payne once said that he thought mediocre books made were easier to turn into great movies. The Postman Rings Twice and all. Yeah, um, I haven't read that. Maybe it's a great book. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Was it James? Who wrote that? I've seen the movie. James, James Kane. Kane. I was going to yeah. say James Kahn, but I kept saying that can't be that can't be right. My brain, my hard drive kept saying that's the answer, James Kahn. I was, I was like, I'm not going to say that because that that guy from The Godfather did not write that book. <laughs> it was James Kane. Yeah, he was revered as a pulp, as a good noir yeah. pulp writer yeah. for his uh, league, the league he played in. Um, I think it's so interesting what you just said. It's a very different experience reading. It's a it's a it's a, it's a different experience. It's, I don't know how else to get at it. I thought you did. I think you said it pretty well. It's a more interior experience that you can sort of live in. And uh, it's uh, uh, you know I don't know what else to how else to describe it. With Matthew Quick's novel, you know that gave me great things. It gave me uh, characters and a predicament that I could then embellish based on my personal experiences. So it was helpful to me, you know, um, with Silver Linings Playbook. But um, I love that sense of a collaboration, you know. That, I mean, I think that's what we're all doing as writers, too. We're collaborating with, with movies we've seen and with books we've read, even by authors who've been dead hundreds of years. You know, we're, we're, we're riffing on them. We're, we're talking to them. I love that, and, I that, love and, that and I learned that that was legitimate. I used to think that was cheating, you know, <laughs> but I, I, but I, when I it was from John Lennon and Bob Dylan, both of whom said they described their act of composing as having another person's song in their head, Hank Williams or yeah. Roy, Roy Orbison's song for days, and they people would think they were just hanging out with them talking, but really they were listening to this song, this Roy Orbison song, and then John Lennon would say, and that's when, and then I wrote my Roy Orbison song, and it, I said, well, that didn't. That worked out great because I, I never <laughs> thought that song was a Roy Orbison song. It doesn't sound anything like Roy Orbison right. to me. So it came out. It's going to come out how you do it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I love that. I mean, and painters have been doing that for centuries. So it it makes perfect sense. Who, who are some of your favorite uh, writers uh, that you talk to or have in your head or floating through your consciousness? Um, well, one of them is here tonight, Michelle Hunnevin. Um <laughs> Probably more if I if the house lights were up I could probably probably more but um, you know so many I, I read a lot of a lot of contemporary people and then I I love the, the you know the great Alice Munro um, and I love <laughs> I, I'm I'm crazy about this new woman named Elena Ferrante who's actually not named Elena Ferrante but that's her pen name she's an Italian a Neapolitan writer who's who's written a bunch of books that are just now in the last few years, being translated into English, and she's never given an interview. She's never no one no one knows who she is. There's rumors that she's a man or she's a couple or who knows what she is. But um, she the only interviews she has submitted to are you know questions given to her publisher. So, but she's wonderful. She's just an amazing immersive writer about a sort of impoverished, gritty childhood in Naples. Uh, what about uh, writers, you know, 100 years old? Or dead writers. Yeah, dead writers, yes. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many. I mean, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I love the obvious ones. I love, you know, Tolstoy. And I read Tolstoy all the time and Chekhov. And, um, 
and Don Quixote I've discovered mm. in the last years. So funny and fabulous. Mm. I would think you'd really like it. Mm. Um, Sancho Panzo. I know. Uh, it's too many. I had to recently do it. You know, they, when, you're, when you publish these days, they, the publisher wants you to publish endless blogs, which I'm sure no one reads. But, um, you know, they're always asking, what are your 10 favorite books? And I, I, did, I did 10 sort of living people or, or, or who've been alive during my lifetime and then 10. And you, you can't pick 10 great novels. There's far too many. Mm, exactly. Which is kind of great. Yes. There's all these riches. And they're cheap. <laughs> many are free if the writer's been dead long enough be downloaded on Google right now. Now, is it true that uh, there were people who would try to buy your books thinking they had been written by the character uh, Homer Simpson's mother, <laughs> who, is, who is named Mona Simpson? Yes. There was an Amazon review that said something like, I bought this review thinking that it had to do with the Simpsons, that it was written by Homer's mother. Um, <laughs> At first, I was pretty disappointed, but it turned out to be a good book anyway. <laughs> it did always, you know, and it's kind of, I know your you're, 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 uh, <laughs> your father of your children contributed to that name happening. Yes, he wrote, the, he, he, yes, he wrote the episode. Richard Some Appel invented Mona Simpson. Named, named, uh... No. <laughs> The character, of, I mean, Homer's mother, Mona Simpson, that Mona Simpson. You know, it's funny, I, I once... <laughs> uh, yeah. There's another Mona Simpson. I once, when I was young, I wrote kind of a mean review of somebody, and I learned not to do that because I was <laughs> ended up at a writer's conference with, with the person. And I'd, I was next to her, and she handled it in the most gracious way. She said, when we, when we were saying goodbye, she said, I'm so glad to have met you because there's another Mona Simpson. <laughs> <laughs> and that Mona Simpson is not a very nice person. <laughs> but you are, and I'm so glad to have met you. <laughs> that was the last scathing review I ever wrote. That's good writing, what that person said. Wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, that's, yeah. A good, that's, a, that's a very... Yes, I underestimated. <laughs> I said, I, get, I, I review what you just said highly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Um, uh, um, do you hang out at writers conferences and with other writers, like, <laughs> other, like other like other big shot writers? Do you do that? Well, that's do a you good have question. Coffee with other, do you call, pick sure, up the phone I know and talk other writers. Al Alice Monroe, or you know, is there like some cool you know club where you guys? <laughs> <laughs> I've met Alice Monroe, but I don't I don't hang up uh, with her. She lives in Ontario, Canada. But um, yeah, writers find each other. It's it's there's so much shop talk. You know, we like to. We like to talk about how to put these things together. You know, we like to talk about who we're reading, but sure, like anything, I think. Did it feel different to write this one as faster than My Hollywood? It felt really, really good. <laughs> I'd like that trend to accelerate. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you have uh, some ideas of where you're headed, or is it too soon? I have two ideas for the next one, but I'm... And I've, I've read that, um, I've never talked to her about this, but another writer I like, Alice McDermott, often apparently starts two novels simultaneously and, and just keeps going until one overtakes the other. And, and then sometimes one dies on the vine, other times she finishes the second one after the first one is complete. So I thought I would try that. I'll, I'll try these two ideas and see which, which predominates. Exciting. Yeah, I want to buy a ticket to this event for that. For yes. That comes out of that. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, I think Thank we should go have some thank drinks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.